Welcome to the Transformational Storyteller Podcast. The stories we tell ourselves and others shape the lives we lead. I'm your host, Dara Lee Lyons. Welcome to another episode of the Transformational Storyteller Podcast, where we listen to people with amazing stories and stories that have the power to transform lives. My guest today, Jennifer Kriatsoulis, is a PhD, and she is wonderful and wise. She's a yoga teacher. She has been through tremendous uh, life experiences and overcome so, so much. And her story is helping other people. Um, it is inspiring. It is powerful. And I just can't wait to hear what she has to say about um, the past that she emerged from and the life that she lives now. So uh, let's listen to her tell her story. I'm so grateful to Dara Least for inviting me to be on her podcast today. It's a really neat feeling to be back here at Renfrew. Um, when I think about Renfrew, I think about revival. This is the place that brought me back to life. Several years ago, after my second daughter was born, uh, Mother's Day weekend, I realized that I needed treatment again. I had been originally diagnosed with anorexia in college, and now, many, many, many years later, I found myself um, not in a good place. It, actually, so unwell that I couldn't push my daughter's stroller when we went through our, for our Mother's Day stroll in the Wissahickon Park. And it was in that moment of just exhaustion, of unable, being unable to show up as the mother that I wanted to be, that I knew it was time to, to get help. And so I came to Renfrew and lo and behold, um, I found my purpose in life. I found wellness. I'm no longer a, what I labeled myself as a sick mother. I'm a very well mother, a strong mother, and very clear with the type of mother that I want to be for my children so that they can develop a healthy relationship with their bodies, with food, and feel confident and empowered in their life. Thank you so much to the Renfrew Center for sponsoring this episode. Um, I cannot say enough amazing things about the Renfrew Center and the impact that they've made on my life personally. Um, so you heard Jennifer tell her story about coming to Renfrew and getting the skills and the resources to be the mother that she wants to be. Uh, for me, I had come into the doors of Renfrew um, just suicidally depressed and desperate and um, having spent my life in and out of various treatment centers and they gave me the skills to create not just a life but the life that I am happy to to lead today and and they taught me how to recover the parts of myself that I thought were long lost so if you are struggling with an eating disorder or someone in your life is struggling with um, issues with food or body weight or um, you know or just uh, self-destructive behaviors around eating or not eating. I cannot say enough wonderful things about Renfrew and I hope that you will go on their website and find out more information and contact them. So the contact information for the Renfrew Center is www.renfrewcenter.com. That's R-E-N-F-R-E-W center.com or 1-800-RENFREW. They've been a pioneer in the field of eating disorders, opening the nation's first ever eating disorder treatment facility in 1985. And now they have centers all over the nation um, and two residential options, uh, day treatment programs, intensive out treatment programs, therapy, nutrition. So really whatever level of struggle you are at, um, RENFREW, might be helpful, or if you know a woman uh, who is challenged in this area, I highly encourage you to seek support for her um, and to give her a life that she deserves to live. Jennifer, thank you so much for coming on today. I'm so excited to talk to you. Oh, I'm thrilled. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and you know, the story that you told about being 
a mom and really being confronted with the fact that you just didn't have the energy for that. I mean, I really like, what was that like for you? It was heartbreaking. Yeah. It was really heartbreaking. Um, I mean, I can just call to mind that memory so quickly. Like it's just so in me, yeah. you know, um, it was a beautiful day. It was mother's day. Yeah. You know, every, all the families are walking around in this like, would seem like this ideal, joyful state, you know, people are walking their dogs, riding horses, you know, kids running. And, and my family, from the outside, we looked super happy like everyone else. And on the inside, I just, I was, I was dying. Yeah. You know? And we just got to this point and I just could not move. I couldn't go any further. Um, and it was, it was painful, but it was, an awakening. Yeah, you know, yeah. It was just like, you know what? This is not okay. I'm not going to do this to my family. This is not who I want to be in the world for my children, for my husband, for myself. Yes. Um, and as terrified as I was of, you know, leaving my children for treatment, it was really the only way. Well, right, because they didn't, you were walking around a shell of a person right i mean yeah there's just no way when you're not feeding yourself or caring for yourself appropriately like how do you even right care for someone else exactly and it, it was just this awareness that i had you know reached the point of what i call no return right the point of no return like when you know in your heart that you can't get out of this hole without help yes right? yes and there's no shame in that no. There's no shame in that, you know, and that's what I, I tell other people all the time now. You know, there's no shame in that. Having the awareness um, that you've reached that point. Right. right? That, you, that you're accepting that as wisdom and truth and acting on it, that's being strong. Yeah, and I mean, I think so many of the people who come on the podcast, and even just in, in my own life, right? Like, it's, I think we hit a place of just utter desperation and feeling like, you know, I can't go any further in this way. And, you know, sometimes people might not know what another way is. I know for me, I didn't really necessarily know what another way was, but I had just sort of exhausted the end of those options. And as someone who I'm a person who kind of has to learn things the hard way. So I need to sometimes get to a place of like really feeling like, you know what, this this isn't working before I'm willing to be humble enough to try to figure out a different way. Yeah. Well, I had been lucky to have had probably a good 15, 16 years of strong recovery yeah. um, before this relapse. So I knew there was another way because I had lived it. Got it. Um, and so knowing that I could get back to that. But what's interesting is even, you know, in coming to Renfrew, doing the work here, what I realized was even though I'm saying to you, I had strong recovery for 15 or 16 years, realizing that actually in those 15 or 16 years, I was, I was well, but I was still kind of just managing the eating disorder. Yes, yes. You know, there were still these rules in place. Um, and on the outside, I looked fine. And mentally, I was fine. Yeah. But I wasn't, I wasn't free. Right, right. You know? Yeah. And so that's, that's the difference. And that was a huge insight that I, that I uncovered, you know, in, in my relapse and doing the work yeah. after that. And so now it's, it's always trying to hold myself up to this idea of, okay, you're making a choice right now. Is this managing an eating disorder? Is this healing an eating disorder? Yeah, right, right. right. And just having that constant awareness. Well, and in some ways then your relapse was really a gift because if you hadn't had that, yeah. It was a gift. That is what I call it. Um, It was a gift for so many reasons. You know, for, you know, the internal work that I did, right, to come to these new awarenesses. it also helped me to be, like I shared, you know, get strong for my children. Yeah. And now I'm, my husband and I are a team and we are really clear about when we are with our kids um, or just out in the world in general, how yeah. are we talking about food? How are we talking about bodies? How are we talking about exercise? Right. right? So really thinking a lot about language and, and, and how, what we're modeling for them. Yeah. Um, so I feel really empowered since that relapse to be in, be able to do that. Um, and it, you know, got me in touch with my purpose, yeah, which yeah. is to now help others on their healing path. 
Right. Absolutely. And I told, I want to talk a lot more. There were so many things that you said that I'm like, I want to ask her about this. <laughs> and I want to ask her about this. And, you know, I think it's really important. Like people don't even really know how to talk about bodies or how to talk about food or like how to be loving towards themselves. And so can you speak a little bit more about that? Like what you've learned in your journey about yeah, that? Absolutely. And to your point, it is hard, I think, because the messages that we are enmeshed and around food and bodies are so confusing. Yeah. Right? Um, the morality language that's been mapped on to food and bodies. Right. right? It's not good or bad. It's, it just is, it right? Is, yeah. But we as a, a culture, as a society, we don't know how to relate to food other than good or bad. Yeah. It, like I'm talking in general terms, of course. Right. Right. So this language that we've inherited around, you know, good, bad, guilty, um, you know, this, this morality language, yeah. right? So if every time I eat X food, you know, that is called bad, I, I take it in. It's like, I am bad. I am bad. I am bad. Yeah. Right. So our moral worth and what we eat has somehow gotten tangled up. Yeah. Right. 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 And so in our home, right, we don't talk about food as good or bad. We don't put any moral language around food, yeah. right? All food is new. Like, Food is neutral. Yes. This is something yoga has taught me. Yeah. Reality is neutral. Food is part of that. So for for my husband and I really um, honoring that truth, yeah. you know, not using food as a punishment or reward. Right, right. You Which know? I think people don't even realize that they're doing no. it unconsciously right. or whatever. And, and, yeah. And, and for people listening who do do that, please know I'm not shaming you or judging you, right? Yes. Trust me, my kids can push me to 60 in like three seconds. Yeah, and it yeah. would be so easy to be like, just do your homework and you can have the cookie. Yeah, <laughs> right? right, right. But I, I'm i very mindful to not because then we are, then we're linking behavior with food. Yes. Right, yes. so, you know, kind of just removing that whole dynamic of, you know, punishment and reward with food. You know, when it comes to um, talking about bodies, like we don't comment on body parts right. or, or, yeah. you know, we, we're thinking about, you know, values and virtues. So thinking about strength, thinking about resilience, commenting on like how courageous, you know, my daughter's being for just the other day, trying to ride a bike without her training wheels for yeah, the first time. Yeah. Right. It's not like, Oh, you're so look at, look at how fast you could go with your little legs. Yeah, right, right. It's like, right. wow, you're being so brave right now. Yes, yes. You know? Um, well, and the thing that you mentioned, you know, you talked about sort of you're in, on this walk in the Wissahickon with your family, and inside you're dying, right? But out from the outside you look good, and I, or look, you know, like a happy, really yeah, yeah, family. <laughs> and, you know, I think that that's something that I really was so cognizant of as someone who struggled for many years with bulimia. Like, you know, people would often compliment me on the way that I looked, and inside I was like just mm -hmm. dying and they had no idea what was going on behind the surface. And so I know like personally, I never comment on people's weight, body, shape or size. You know, I might say like, oh, you like, that's a beautiful dress or I love your outfit or, you know, that kind of thing. But I'm, I don't comment because I never know what's going on behind the scenes in someone's life. And I, and, and also, you know, I don't think that I don't think that our physical exterior appearance is indicative of anything about us as, as a human, as human beings. That's right. That's yeah. Right. And so in, I know for one of my personal missions, you know, with my children, but you know, my clients, people that I meet, just who I am in the world, I'm always looking to identify internal qualities Yes. and help raise people up that way. Right, yeah. because we are so used to valuing external validation. Yes. Right. We don't really know how to validate ourselves internally, well, in general. Yeah. Again, I'm talking in general terms. Not yes. everyone, but there is, you know, there's so much value on the externals in our world, and so, you know, shifting that dialogue, shifting that language, so that people start connecting with their insides. Yeah. 
Yeah. No. Well, and when you talked about, you know, being brave and talking to your daughter and saying like, oh, you know, great, you can ride a bike because like you're so brave and look at you, you know, it's interesting because there's a lot of research out there now about the difference between like a fixed kind of like a fixed intelligence mindset or like a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset. Okay. And just that like, you know, a lot of people devalue their potential because of this idea that they're told like, oh, well, you're the smart one or you're the pretty one or you're the one who fill in the blank. And and it kind of puts people into these boxes. I hope I'm explaining it correctly, but yeah. Um, and that when you operate from more of a like value-based sort of mindset, that if someone isn't immediately like quote unquote good at math, right? It like, if you say to someone like, wow, you're working really hard to learn fractions, mm -hmm. that allows them to believe that like, oh, I don't have to be bad at math, right? So like, it's not just about how we talk about bodies or food or our weight and shape. Like it's how we talk about all things that if people come to life with a perspective of like, possibility right yes, and yes. a perspective of oh i just you know i'm not a good or bad person i'm just someone who is exhibiting certain behaviors in this moment like it's life-changing absolutely it's like it's shifting the, the focus from outcome yeah to like experience right right, right. yeah like what am i experiencing in this moment yeah yeah and i think that's probably most of what you do as a yoga therapist, right? Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit more about what it is to be a yoga therapist and kind of who you work with? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I am, like you said, I'm a certified yoga therapist. Yeah. I um, have three years of training um, and also have been teaching yoga since 2002. So okay. I've been yes. in the yoga world for a long time. There's definitely a, the yoga practice, you know, my yoga practice is, was a big part of what um, helped me in my healing yes. way back when. Yes. So that's just intrinsic to who I am and, and my healing. Um, and so when I came out of Renfrew, um, you know, I decided that I wanted to change kind of my path. Yeah. Because I had, you know, gone to graduate school, became a medical writer, and as wonderful and fun as that was, that work wasn't my passion. Right. It didn't nourish me. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'd always had this nagging voice inside that were, there was more for me to do, but I, I just never paid attention to it, you know? Well, how could you, right? You were starving yourself on a multitude of yeah, levels. So, like of course, you're, doing life, yeah, wasn't, yeah, you know, yeah. Okay, whatever. And I, I and honestly, I there were no answers coming, even when I would pause to consider yeah, it. So I just right. I just swallowed it, let it yes. go. Um, but when I, when I came into treatment, I committed to myself that I was going to figure out what that voice was telling me. Yeah. Um, so when I, you know, got strong, I, I hired a coach, did a little work, and somehow, I don't even know, Google landed me on the Yoga Life Institute webpage, um, their yoga therapy program. Yeah. Um, they're a wonderful uh, yoga organization right in King of Prussia, okay. here in the Pennsylvania, Philadelphia area. Anyway, so I remember like reading about the program and I was vibrating. Like I was just electrified. I was like, this is it. This is what I'm meant to do. You know, I'm not, be, I'm not able to go back to school for another degree to go into like mental health or something, but this I can do, you know, it was three years, one week in a month. It was a big commitment, Oh, but tremendous. with two little ones and a husband, yeah. it was, it was manageable. It would allow me to bring to life yoga in a new way and now use it as a way to help people. So yoga therapy is working with people typically one-on-one, -on -one, but it doesn't have to be, typically one-on-one, -on -one, calling on the tools, the practices, of the philosophies of yoga to support people in the changes they want to make in their mm. life, right? So it's very different than a yoga class where yes. you, know, you roll out your mat and you follow along a sequence. This is very, very individualized, very customized. Yep. Um, sessions include everything from discussion to maybe some education on some yoga philosophy, Drawing, drawing on some type of practice, whether that's poses, breathing, yeah. meditation, uh, mantra, maybe a combination, um, to help pe people connect with something that they want to create or change in their life. Yeah. So I've taken my training and I've applied it now to eating disorder recovery. Mm -hmm. 
Um, what I realized in my work here, well, actually it was probably a little later on, but that, you know, if I'm going to be an expert in anything, if I'm going to know how to authentically talk about anything, yeah. it is an eating disorder. Right. And it is yes. healing in, yes. from an eating disorder. Yes. Right? Because I've been doing this for over 20 years. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So um, I never believed that until someone, a mentor of mine said to me, you know, Jennifer, like you are capable of everything because of the eating disorder and in spite of it. Right. Right. And I was yeah. Like, wow. Okay, let's do this. That is so, so amazing. I didn't go into the yoga therapy program thinking that I would be working with others in recovery. It never crossed my mind. But during that program and doing my own work and my own internal work as well, it just, it was like, yeah, this is totally what I'm meant to do. Yeah. So, um, so I work with others, like I've said, on their healing journey. Yep. Um, I'm not a therapist, right? So I don't have those credentials. I'm not a dietitian. I'm not doing any of that work. I'm more of an adjunctive supplemental yes. team member. Right. So how I describe it is while, you know, say you're in therapy and things are getting stirred up in therapy, right? In yoga therapy, we work on creating healthy coping skills yep. to help you deal with what's coming up with in therapy. Well, probably that and also if someone maybe hits a plateau, because you do, right, in therapy oh, or at any absolutely. sort of... All phases. Yeah. But just to kind of give some context. Yeah. So, like, if you're working on something in therapy and, you know, your anxiety shoots up, yep. right, and your urges shoot up, right? In yoga therapy, what we're doing is we're like, you know, we're not processing it the same way the therapist does, but we're saying, okay, well, what are some, maybe some beliefs that are driving this? Or, you know, let's look at how this anxiety plays out in your body. Yeah. And let's you know, what's the internal dialogue about? Can we maybe bring in a yoga philosophy to help bring a new perspective? Yep. Um, can we create maybe a 10 minute movement practice based on maybe a theme of resilience or strength or whatever it is that you need to call on to help you manage during this kind of like time of intense anxiety? Yes. Right? Can we create some grounding techniques to help you in real time with the anxiety, mm, yeah. um, you know, anxiety around mealtime, right? Yeah. Let's bring in some tools there. Yeah. So it's really hands-on, tangible stuff that I'm doing with clients. And I and find- And personal, like incredibly personalized. Incredibly and, personalized, yeah. right? So I work with people in person, I work with people online, I have clients, you know, in the US and now abroad, which is really yeah. exciting um, and I find it so nourishing, yeah. so nourishing, you know, and I always share with people when I'm doing a consultation with them that, look, we speak the same language. Yeah. There's nothing yeah. you can say or do or share that I probably haven't done myself at some point yes. or thought myself. And so when I say that and, and people realize that they are really heard and seen and understood, it's like the walls come down and they allow themselves to go a little deeper into their story and into their work. And it is so, it's just such powerful stuff. Yeah, it is, it's tremendous. And I am not a yoga therapist. I am a yoga teacher. And I often will say that the mat is like a mirror for mm -hmm. how we, find, you know, how we are on the mat yeah. is often a mirror for how we are in the world. Yeah. And so, you know, it's funny, like I'll be teaching a yoga class and someone comes to their mat with like an attitude of striving, right? Yes. And like that you can see they're yes. like at their edge every moment, you know, and someone else kind of comes to their mat with an attitude of like, ah, I'm just going to do my own thing. You know, I don't really need to follow the teacher's suggestions or whatnot. And I feel like because the work you do is so highly individualized, it's not just a mirror. They're not just looking at them, you know, at what is, but you're also equip equipping people with the tools and the resources to create different possibilities for their lives. That's right. That's like beautifully said. Absolutely. Yeah. Just taking, you know, what they're working on, looking at it from a couple different angles, including their bodies, right? Like I really believe we must include our bodies in the process of healing our minds. Yes. Right? And that doesn't mean we have to learn how to stand on our heads. It could mean learning how to give ourselves permission to take a deep breath yeah. or, you know, to do, to, to ease into some movement. And for a lot of people that I work with, you know, movement equals exercise equals burning calories equals eating disorder. Yes. Right? So 
untangling that and expanding what movement means, right? Yeah. So finding new ways to define these terms and relate to them so that they can create, you know, a healthier relationship. Yes. Right. With, for example, movement. So the movement work that we do, you know, getting people back in their bodies, being able to do that in a one on one environment that's really supportive, yeah. that they can say, hey, this is too much. This is freaking me out. This is scary. Or, hey, oh, my goodness, I couldn't do this two weeks ago. I'm, I'm OK right now. I can do right. this. Right. Yeah. And so that there's this constant interaction and support um, for this process that is so fragile. Yes. It's a big deal to, yeah. to come back to one's body after they've severed that relationship or have committed, you know, so much time to trying to escape their body. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I don't think that's just relegated to the eating disorder population. Like, I feel like we are conditioned in this society to have a mind body disconnect right. and um, I actually a big part of my own eating disorder recovery because I like used to run I was a competitive athlete and all that mm -hmm. stuff and finally one day you know on when I was sort of well into recovery I realized like oh I don't actually like running like I actually <laughs> don't like it right, you know right. and so I gave it up and I was like huh like this is cool how do I want to move my body do right. I want to dance do I want to you know right. whatever do yoga do I want to lay on the couch and right. you know watch TV and just being able to really get people in their bodies yeah. to even yes. decode like, yeah. you know, what does my body want? Cause I don't, I don't think we're taught right. to really know that. That's right. And a big piece of my work that I'm doing in the yoga community is thinking about, you know, in our general classes, thinking about the language that we're using in our general classes. Yeah. Because a lot of the language that we're taught as yoga teachers is passed out, and it and it needs to be for for yeah, learning for learning yeah. reasons. However, a lot of that language can be really triggering for people who are uncomfortable in their bodies. Yeah, doesn't have, they don't have to have an eating disorder, right? And it can be really triggering and disruptive to a recovery process. Yeah, a lot of the environments, um, different offerings that are available now and this is not criticizing those offerings right but from my perspective and for the people that I work with you know finding those settings and teachers that are a little more sensitive yes. and more connected to the trueness of yoga right yeah um, because we need I think as a community to give people permission to to go back to what you were saying to have their own experience with their bodies. Yeah. So what I'm getting at is things like we can work on maybe prescribing less where people should be feeling poses in their bodies. Right, right. Because not everybody is feeling the same thing, right? And so if I'm if I'm someone who has a, has a relationship with my body that is really um, like filled with turmoil, mm -hmm. right? And I show up for class and I'm told I should feel this pose here and I don't. It's like, shit, my body's wrong again. Yeah. My body's wrong again, my body's wrong again, right? So as a yoga community, you know, I'm, I'm getting out there and giving trainings on, on language and, and different things related to body image. And so just having an awareness that we can create movement experiences without prescribing Yes. what people need to feel so that they can develop their own relationship with their bodies. Well, and I mean, a lot of people have been through some level of trauma, right? Whether That's it's right. like sexual trauma, right. emotional trauma, wh whatnot. And I really believe that those feelings can get stored on a body Absolutely. level. And so sometimes, you know, people, I, I've had many clients who go into a pose where, you know, for one person it might feel phenomenal and for another person it brings up a lot of old memories. And so I'm a huge proponent of yoga. I'm not knocking yoga, but I do think that it's really useful for people to be able to come to their mats with this sense of like, well, what is going on for me? What is right for me? And I think in recovery it's the same thing when you're recovering from an eating disorder or drug and alcohol or any sort of... Uh, like, you know, self-abusive behavior, like, can I come back into my body in a way where I'm in tune with what's right, That's right. for me? And, you know, if someone has years of either self-abuse or being abused by others, like, that yeah. can take a lot of yeah. skills that they might not 
quite have acquired yet. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. right. It's a really, you know, healing is delicate. It is. You know, for, for all of us, we're human. Healing yeah. is delicate. And so, you know, as a yoga therapist, it's really such an honor to hold space for others in that process of healing. Yeah, yeah. And do you find that it's deepened your own healing with yourself as you've given absolutely. it away? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And what about, so I want to talk about your book, but I just had the thought and I'm like, ah, let me ask it before <laughs> I forget it. Um, so you're a mother yes. and you have two daughters. Yes. So what, like, how do you feel like your relationship with yoga and recovery has influenced how you parent? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for asking that. I really appreciate that question. Um, you know, we use the word kindness in our house a lot. So trying to instill that value in our interactions with each other. Yes. You know, um, yes, I want my daughters and myself and my husband, we, we all want to express ourselves and I want to empower them to express themselves. And sometimes, you know, as humans, we don't express ourselves in kind ways. Yeah. Right. So I work really hard. I'm not always successful, but I work really hard to take those moments when we're not interacting in kind ways to say, hey, I want you to express yourself. Can you say that in a kinder way? Yeah. Right? So that that value gets instilled. Well, I love that you said that and the way that you focused on it, you know, like you're not always a perfect person. And, you know, and I think so yoga, right? It's um, we talk a lot about having a yoga practice. Mm -hmm. And I think so much of any sort of life skill or whatever is about the practice can we implement things yes. into our daily lives and there are times when we just can't right. or times when it feels more challenging than right. others and so the ability to practice kindness yes. as a lived value That's feels right. really important yeah, to me that, yeah I loved how you said that yes um, and we we also you know think about taking a deep breath once in a while yeah um, they have done a little bit of yoga at school and at home and so they often will like you know just pop into a pose or like mommy look at this yeah. you know we make it fun yes, right? yes, yes, yes um i don't do it religiously with them or anything at this point yeah. i mean honestly it's i need it <laughs> right, <laughs> right right right, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but I, I would say like the kindness piece is the piece where we're focused right now. You know, they're going to be turning six and eight this summer. Yeah. You know, and joy, right? Like joy, like go out and have fun. Be kids, ride your bikes, like yeah. play with other kids. You know, I love how free my daughters are to just move. Like yes. my daughters will get up and just start dancing. They'll start doing, making silly shapes. They'll start yeah. running. They're just, they don't, they're not self-conscious yet. Right. Well, and that's the thing, like, I mean, I think we're born with these, like, innate capacities to... Freedom. See, yeah, to, yeah. like, and we know what we want to eat, and when yeah. we want to eat, like, a kid might eat 17 oh times in one day, I and then, like, like not be, yeah, yeah, and then not be hungry the next day, or yeah. whatever, like, I mean, I just think there's, like, this freedom to move, to be, to eat, yeah, to laugh, to... It's beautiful yeah. to witness. Yeah, like, and then we, like, unlearn it, yes. right, and, and then have to spend the rest of our lives hopefully getting back to yes. that place that was now truly there yeah. in childhood yeah, yeah. I mean yeah. they've taught me so much about hunger actually yes you know like hunger is not a crisis right you know yeah. hunger will come back yeah there is no schedule yeah right yes. and so yes. like when I came out of treatment and you know I was trying to integrate back into life I was actually really studying them to help me yeah. you know and that's when I realized I'm like okay this is not a crisis to be hungry actually right. We can smile and laugh about it. It's yeah, kind of fun, you yeah, know? right. Um, or you know, like it, it, it will come back, and and it, you know, like eat. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? yeah, absolutely. You know? And so studying them and watching them um, enjoy food and take such pleasure and joy in in the process of, of it all. They've been great teachers for me. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, oh my god. Well, and. You've been a great teacher and continue to be a great teacher for others. And I want to ask you a little bit more about the book that you wrote about 
utilizing yoga like so can you give the title can you talk a little bit more about the book yeah yeah so the name of the book is body mindful yoga yeah um i actually had the really great honor of writing it with uh, Bob Utera, who is the founder of Yoga Life Institute, yes, okay. and my primary uh, yoga therapy teacher and mentor. Um, so the book is an exploration of the relationship between language and body image, and how the way we use words, receive words, internalize words, how that all translates into how we're feeling about ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. How we're holding ourselves, how we're dressing ourselves, how we're perceiving ourselves, how we're perceiving other people's bodies. Yes, yes. Right? And so the first half of the book um, is in yoga what we call self study, so self reflection. Mm-hmm. Yep. Right? And we guide readers to explore what their current relationship with their body is, what have been some factors that have influenced that in their life. Yes. We dive into four facets of society we look at food fitness, social media, and fashion. Okay. And we look at some of the kind of discourses that run through those. So for example, the food chapter is about the morality language. Yep, yep. Fitness is thinking about the combat language that's used around working out. Yeah, right, Social media. And even just working, right? Like, like why does it have to be working out? Why can't it just be like, (gasps) right? I don't know, like going for a walk or right, right. dancing but around the house no, or whatever. It's yeah, gotta blast this and bust yeah. that, and, right? You know, right? Yeah. Tame this and right. Yes. So all the combat language um, in social media, we look at how that taps into our, like our very primal instinct for belonging, yeah. which is a beautiful thing. Yes, and helping people become aware of well, when does that belonging cross over into like dependence on like external validation? Right. And then in the fashion chapter, we look at the language around status. Yeah. So we talk about these different discourses. We set up, oh, then we look at some popular slogans okay. and phrases yeah. in these areas of our society. Yep. And we say, so if this phrase is pushing your buttons, yeah. answer these questions and figure out like, what's this really about for you? Yeah. Right? And then how can we create some more empowering or affirming language and then the second half of the book are yoga practices, yeah. varieties of practice. So movement, meditation, visual practices, auditory practices um, that we invite people to do regularly to help them begin to wire in new language, yeah. right? Because we don't just wake up and be like, okay, I'm happy today, I love myself and yay. Yeah, right? Right, It's like right. this awareness of like, okay, I'm, I'm saying these things about myself every day and they are really disempowering. Yes, yes. So now I have this awareness, yeah. right? So let me take what I've learned about this awareness. Let me find some language that feels authentic. Yes. It doesn't have to be super inflated with like self-love, but just like a little kinder. Mm-hmm. And let me start wiring it in with some practices, right? Because we need, we need our bodies to help our brains wire in yeah, and that synchronicity yes. of of I love that you bring language into yes. it and bot and movement and yes. yeah, right? yeah. And then the last chapter is how can we then go out in the world and model this, mm. right? So, if you know if I have a habit of talking negatively about my body in front of my family, right? Like maybe that's a pattern that's that's taken place over my lifetime, right? Yes. If I now have an awareness that when I'm with certain people or when I'm looking at social media or when I'm in the grocery store, that I start saying certain things about myself. Now that I now I have this awareness, yeah. now my work is to begin eliminating it. Eliminate yeah. that language because it is a drain on the system. Yes. It just creates that body image despair, right? Right. So now I have this awareness, what can I replace it with? And body image despair is not limited to people with eating no. disorders. It's not no. limited to women. It's, no. I mean, I think it's culturally exactly. pervasive exactly. right now. And um, exactly. yeah, so yeah. I, you know, I passionately believe that like improving the way we feel about our bodies, it's an inside job and our language is directly connected to that. Yeah. It's what we're saying to ourselves. It's yes. what we're saying to others. Yes. Yes. You know, yeah. it's how we are communicating about ourselves or communicating about other people's bodies. And so I, fi- I feel like it's, it's a place of empowerment in our lives where we 
we do have some power yeah. To, yeah. To, to, to make a shift. And right. I'm not saying, I mean, it's, it's hard work. It, it, it takes practice. Yeah. It takes consistency and awareness. But if you're someone that's been struggling with body image and you want to make a change, well, here is one way that you can do it that is completely accessible. Well, and the word yoga, right, if we break, it means union and discipline, right? I mean, I think it means various things, however you translate it, but like essentially one of the more mainstream definitions is that yoga means union and discipline. And so I really love how you tied it into kind of language and self messaging and like, can we orient ourselves? Can we unify ourselves with a more authentic, more kind way of right. being in the world? And then can we discipline ourselves to practice that? Because over time, that becomes our new normal. That's right. And I always go back to my children, right? Yeah. My children are hearing everything I say. Yeah, yeah. So if I can model for them body mindful language, yep. right? Meaning language that is mindful of my, you know, how we're talking about bodies, then at least at home in our foundation, they have a, like they have a stronger foundation yes. for when it is time for them to kind of go out into the world and fa- be faced with all the language that they are going to be yeah. faced with, right? Yeah. And as yoga practitioners, we, I, I love to do workshops um, in guiding people to pay attention to their inner dialogue while they're practicing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, because there's a, a lot that comes up there. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So we don't always focus on that. Right. Right. And right. so how are we talking to ourselves when we're doing our practices as well? Where is there room on our mats for more kindness, for more compassion, for more neutrality? Right? Because if we're here like in despair, it's not reasonable to be like here. Right. All yeah. the time. Like yeah. this is an ebb and flow relationship. Like and I think for so many who struggle with body image, eating disorders, you know, the black and white thinking, it's like, well, I either have to hate myself or love myself. Well, no, actually, being yeah. in relationship with yourself is giving yourself permission to ebb and flow. Right. And if you find yourself more on the despair end of the world on a given day, yeah. you, what are some tools that can help you move a little bit this way? Yeah. You don't have to be all the way over here. Absolutely. Right? And that unrealistic expectation. I mean, you mentioned slogans and one of the slogans I like is this too shall pass, right? And it's true of both the, like the overwhelming ecstatic joy and the, like, you know, the, like, I hate my life and I don't want to live. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so that unrealistic expectation of, well, you should be happy all the time. And if you're not happy all the time, then there's something wrong with you. It's like, yeah. So, that but, creates more yeah. despair. But it comes back to, I think, we need to be able to give ourselves permission to not be happy all the time. Yeah. yeah. And we need to give ourselves permission to say, okay, I'm not happy all the time. Um, I'm not happy right now. Okay, I accept that. And what's one small thing I can do for myself? One small shift I can make to just feel maybe a, not even happier, just a little more present. Yes. Right? Yes. A little less trapped in my head. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, I'm so appreciative of this and of you coming and like oh, talking so about, fun. yeah. I feel like we could talk for hours. Oh my gosh. I know. <laughs> I know. Well, and one thing, so this is a podcast about stories and how stories have the power to transform. And I'm sure you know this from reading to your daughters, but you know, so many good book stories um, will have like some sort of moral or lesson or something. And if you you know, if, if you could look at your life and say, you know what, I really want this to be a lesson that people could get from this or a moral from my story. Like what, what moral or lesson would you sort of choose to impart to others? I think it is if you have a nagging voice inside of you, yeah. pay attention. Yeah. You know, because that's some wisdom that's trying to get through. Yeah. Right. And I didn't pay attention. And that was part you know, that contributed to my relapse, yes, right? So yes. I'm, I'm always now listening. Right, you know? yeah. So I would say, you know, take time to listen to, to those nagging voices that are saying like a change is needed or um, follow your dream or, yeah. you know, whatever it is. Oh, I love that you said that. I so relate, like that hits me on such a heart level. Um, I've told this story before on the podcast, but you know, like I believe that our 
intuition whispers and if we don't listen to its whispers it starts to talk mm -hmm. and if we don't listen to it, it talking it starts to scream <laughs> yeah and then you know eventually we get like knocked you know we yeah. get walloped in the side of the face by yeah. our intuition and I um you know the first time I ever came to yoga I had these screaming voices inside of me and now because I pay attention to the whispers and the talk or well I try to pay attention to the yes. whispers I'm not always successful yes. but um but yeah, like there's just a lot less like inner angst that ha that goes on when you're so more true. guided by the the deep knowing that I think exists in all of us. That's true. You know, I always say like, for me, you know, the eating disorder was like a silent temper tantrum. Yeah. You know? Yes. Yes. And so if I don't listen, and that keeps going on and on and on and on, yeah. you know, I mean, I don't think I, I don't foresee that. Kind of same path right. Again, no, no, but no. I just am aware that, you know, I'm vulnerable to that. Yes, yes. You know? Yeah. yeah. And I think everybody is vulnerable to what whatever manifestation of not living authentically, like, you know, some people might be prone to picking up alcohol or acting out sexually or just, you know, or being depressed, like prone to right. chronic depression or, you know, whatever. I think that not living a life that is in tune with our authentic voice, like it's gonna set people up for some level of misery, whatever form that takes, yeah, yeah. And so I also want to tell people, because I think you're so inspiring and there are probably people who are listening who are like, how do I learn more about the book? Or, <laughs> you know, oh, I've got someone in my life who I think could really benefit from yoga-based therapy. Like, so how do people get in touch with you? Where do they buy the book? Like just, um, and I will, we will put in a uh, link to buy the book in the show notes so that people can like, you know, get access to that. We'll put a link to your website in the show notes, yeah. et cetera. But tell, give people the info. Yeah. So yeah. my website is um, yoga4eatingdisorders.com. It's the number four. So www.yoga4eatingdisorders.com. My email is jennifer at yoga4eatingdisorders.com. I'm on social media. Um, you can buy the book on Amazon. And I would absolutely love to hear from you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I really, really appreciate you being here. And I feel like I, it's such an inspiration for me. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> definitely, um, like it really also makes me want to reflect on where, because I think I have come a long way in my healing journey, but I think there's always deeper levels of like self-kindness and compassion that are available Absolutely. and like, looking at our messaging and stuff. So I can't wait to dig into you. your book and really like, you know, just figure out where I might not be like in total alignment with my values. And, and I hope that my viewers and listeners will do the same because it's really just your practice is beautiful. And I feel like you exude your message. Oh, and so thank you. thank you so much. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So much of what Jennifer and I were talking about today has to do with strength and resilience. And so to that end, one of our um, podcast episode sponsors is Just Strong, which is a lifestyle and clothing brand for women who are, um, you know, who harness their own strength and their power. And so Just Strong's symbol is the squat. And what they have to say about that is that the real strength comes not from getting down, but from getting back up after you've gotten down. And so if you would like to take advantage of their 10% of off, which they are granting, generously granting to any of our podcast uh, viewers or listeners, go to www.juststrong.com and enter the coupon code DARALEASE10 for 10% off at checkout. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Transformational Storyteller Podcast. As always, thanks to our episode sponsors, our production team at Rebel Hill Consulting, and of course, many thanks to you, the listener. Whoever you are, wherever you are, I hope you're creating stories that empower you and inspire others.